talk Terry Hans. We can talk Terry Hans. How is your morning going? Oh, it's uh, it's about 8 p.m. in Europe right now, but good evening to you. I'm sorry, it took me a while to get this uh, system working. How's it going? Be well. Be well. <laughs> Como esta? interested in trying out the foundry, just visit targarynova.com. Como esta, caballeros? How y'all doing? Oh, I'm awesome. Oli. So I was at the beach earlier. Um, I walked by this, this place and I bought a, uh, a knife in a Chinese store. So that I could open things with, and it's amazing what you can get anywhere on the planet now. I was worried, oh, I'd have to get stuff on the internet. How would I get it? But you just go into any corner now, and there's these Chinese stores, and they have everything from China. Also, I've been walking around looking at a lot of the architecture here, and there's just so much brick buildings that are from, you know, a hundred years ago or or 150 years ago. But then there will be other buildings built right around them. You know, so you have like a tower. But there'll be a bridge just built next to it. There'll be like these malls built around these towers. So it takes a while to find them. So you have to walk around. But I finally got over towards the center, which is um, what Mike has been pointing out as the starport. And it, it's interesting how it's designed because the entire place is this super dense construction around what was a river. And they call it the river. But it's not a river, it's a mud flood. It's a long mud path that swamped the entirety of the Valencia region, except for the center, which is a giant star fort. So that's been pretty interesting, walking around seeing that. And also, apparently everyone's doing all the construction right now. So I went and I got some footage, like the first day I got here, I got some water from one of these water fountains. And it's like a 150 year old, at least, fountain with the face of um, Poseidon that spits into your mouth, you know, out of his mouth. Um, pure water and the next day I went back there and there's this metal grate around it because they're about to tear out the entire corner and build some new building and I'm sure it's going to be like you know a nice fancy modern square boring looking building but on that same street you know you'll find all of these all of these really really old buildings that are being kind of like in the 70s in Britain there's squatters so you'll find the anarchists have buildings that say like 1850 or something, but the one is a J. And <laughs> so it says J850, uh, which I think is also pretty interesting. There's a lot of that. I've always thought about the interchangeability of the J and the I in, mm -hmm. in Christ's name mm -hmm. and wondered if that's the attribution there. So one of the weirdest things also is it looks a little bit like a broken zero the j zero i and looking into sanskrit like the the, the arabic yeah. name, and valencia is a very arabic area so the thing also that i've noticed strange here is like these clocks that all have the arabic ones and you know numerals instead of the roman numerals which you know they all look like um roman style 
clocks, but for the face. And then around them, the buildings themselves have Moorish um, architecture to them too, but they'll have gargoyles and things. So there's a very, very clear neoclassical architecture here. That's from, it, looks, it looks so similar to what I saw in Peru in the rainforest. And you know what we're, what we're noticing with the, the Tartarian buildings in Auckland, um, I, I'm just so surprised how they just stick out everywhere. And they're so clean. Everything's so clean here. Oh, yes, and this guy. So this is something that blew my mind. I need to actually go get some video around here. But if you're looking at Mike's screen, this is a full-size um, Gilligan, right? It's a dude. He's a giant Gulliver. being tied down. And Gulliver. Gulliver's Thruffles. Yeah, Gull Gulliver. Gulliver. Sorry, Gulliver. Yes. <laughs> Freudian slip. So Gulliver is tied down by all these little uh, guys. Where's where's that at? Can you go back to that, Mike? Can you can you uh, put on your screen for a second so we can focus on that? But yeah, you've got little people all around it that are you know tying him down. So he's in the center of this mud river. You'll find in this triangle point. There's a sphere, and then there's an obelisk, which is his hat. But then a sword on the other side of that, and in between, you know, is his two legs. There's a square between his two legs that you can climb up, and 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 you can actually look out and see everything from about a story or two stories up. But all the people are tiny. Look how tiny. If you see those little black spots, those are actually the people. So just for perspective, how you can walk down his chest and up his um, his arms. I mean, like you can actually get. Just it's it's a completely insane structure. So I don't know what, if if you're curious about what Valencia and giants have to do with each other. So are we. Look at his fingers. As above, as above, so below. I feel like yeah, I, I no, no, that that is uh, the Saturn and He's Jupiter doing the hands. conjunction. He's doing the Catholic hands. It's a sign of benediction, but it's uh, it's Jupiter and Saturn when they conjunct every twenty years. That's what that Victor, signifies. What did you? Hey guys. To go, hello. To go back to your uh, Arabic influence in the area, uh, one of the first texts that I received from Martin uh, dates back to the fourteenth century and talks all about how the uh, the Tartars mixed with the Spaniards and they spent a few years in trade in this area actually mm -hmm. uh, learning each other's languages and receiving envoys and opening up trade. Absolutely. It's funny. This is a, a huge like diamond trade. Too. Yeah. This is a huge diamond trade now, but it, at the time it was used for uh, trafficking mm -hmm. of, you know, artisans a lot of time. You'd sell people from here, but it would, it'd be, you'd sell like creative people who'd go to live for 20 years in a kingdom and you'd, you'd get them from the coast of Spain. And a lot of the time they come from the East Coast, you know, would be more towards the, the Byzantine going East. But this is where a lot of these, uh, the guys can come from supposedly. The guys who are, okay, the guy, architect in, Chile or in Polynesia, why, why does it look like that? Well, it's, apparently it's because they came from here. You know, and they saw the Moorish stuff. That's their, that's their story. I'll tell you guys about Chile, but I have to go stop sneezing for a second. <laughs> for sure. So. I'm trying to find my hard drive to plug in for a second so I can get some more interesting stuff to look at, too. I've been filming a lot of... I just was walking around um, recording this place and going from one street to the next street. Just, you know, it's crazy how... It's like a museum. You go from one time to another time. You can see the Franco period. You can see the Spanish classical period. You can see the kind of socialist architecture and then this modern, ultra modern rapid transit system and everything they put in for the football, for the soccer um, cup, so that people could could all they could trains all over, you know, to get here. So all of a sudden there's this crazy amount of infrastructure, these huge new towers they put up. Kind of like China had put put up these ghost cities. They put up these huge brick skyscrapers that, you know, all all across the Midwest of of Spain. And even in the in the east and the west now, there's just 
full cities full of people from everywhere. And it's one of the things the Amazon riots were happening because of all the Amazon factories that they were putting in the west of Spain. Where's that? Where's that? Ooh, wow. there it is. Oh, the house is a very fine house. Two dogs in. What are you doing? Sing in Chicago. What are you guys do? Victor, do you what are you are you pulling up some interesting looking stuff or is that you, Mikey? No, that's me. But it yeah. is all thanks to Victor. Well, it's why don't you, why don't you talk like that. you're selling, selling something? We got these great new star ports right for you. <laughs> look at this amazing stuff. Would you wow. Like oh, look at all these shapes, oh. friend. <laughs> well, what have I done and why is it stop working? Oh, yeah, I like that it? one. Oh. Re 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 and Four. also see the David Star. It's interesting that uh, that that hexagram shows up like that. Are we back? There we go. Our house is a very, very, very fun house. It's this thing was key to like hello batteries and add them all to the Starfort collection and increase my amount of work by a lot. That's mm. a nice symmetry there. Nathan, I wondered. Um, screen share. Right. Uh, uh, Nathan, yeah. share. I can screen share for you, though. Well, I'll tell you if I've got anything worth showing. For now, you keep doing your thing. I'm about to open up my screen. Yeah, because last time you kind of missed that. I'm, I'm a genius, right? I know. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that. Let's see if we get this to work. So I guess if you want to share the screen, but I don't know if I, I forget if this video, I think this video might be something I can't show. So that might not be worth it, but something I could talk about at least the electromagnetic process and the exact sequence of the universal laws that define everything in classical physics for our world, but energy inside the nano world exceed the nuclear unthinkable number of 10 times or 10 to the 74th power. This is all by the way, from a technasis video i'm doing a, a little bit of work trying to do a like a translation of it because it's pretty interesting stuff about nano physics and um nano mechanical energy and the way kinematics work on a, on a fundamental level so one of the things that we're looking at is like copper and quartz and bricks as well as the history of the use of these elements in um, towers. All of these towers we're finding have these points on them, and there's technasmus. Uh, technasma is like a, this trident-like point on the sphere, and it's probable that there's actually like a, a field of thought that that still that still use them. That's that's kind of what we're noticing. Is it's it's possible that they've actually been in use for for some period, you know, during all of this. Uh, collapse anyway even though we've been told that they don't do anything or that they're just like superstitious um, symbols of like you know religions or something it's probable that they're actually hiding that they've been using them for some purpose and then all of them that we're noticing come from these regions where there are forests and there are a lot of forest temples that are made out of living trees and living wood so it seems like pretty likely that that's why that they've been trying to remove and then build new forests because the forest, okay, this is another thing. I was talking to the guy for a preface on why I have this hypothesis. The guy I'm staying with right now, he's got his, his family are from France and from Brazil. He's like a Arawak native Indian from Brazil. And he knows a lot about like, you know, the language that got, I was, we just were talking about that got lost or the dead language that the museum um, had collected all the ev evidence of this language and then the museum was burned down 
in Brazil about two years ago. So they've been trying to systematically erase the history of Brazil. But one of the things we were talking about is forests and being used for energy systems, you know, because they produce all this water and they produce all this um, evaporated energy, produce electricity from lightning storms that then can be put back into the na natural systems. And those are all being removed. And he's like, yeah, just recently, in like the last six months, his home village in the Amazon, they cut down a huge number of trees. And then it just, I think it was the last four or five years. And they haven't had a single so uh, storm since. Like all the water in that region, it used to be rainforest where it would rain every day, pretty much no longer does. So it's pretty interesting that they've, and it seems like they're doing it on purpose because then they can move in and they can put freeways in and they, they can turn it into a, a normal palatable place that they can control but they still need to bring in the energy. And where's the energy coming from? It's not from, I mean, they have been pumping all this energy from this one water power plant that's in this rainforest. And so they've got control of the main rainforest, but they want to make sure that no one else has any access to those rainforests but them. So it's been interesting looking into technasma climatics and um, that's, yeah, it's my new hypothesis is they're trying to control actual forest to control weather patterns. From a completely engineering perspective on the video you're showing, you're looking at the cavity space of magnetrons. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've been using this technology for everything. I was telling Mike a few days, well, two days ago about uh, masers and the precursor for the laser, the spacer, every single thing you get. Um, the old book clubs just made everything smaller. We're just using it and guiding it. So when you get onto the, the rainforest and the collection of ambient energy powering <laughs> this rainforest, if a civilization were to leave and leave their device on, all that energy would have to go somewhere. So without any collection and distribution of it, everything has a bioelectric current. That could be the reason these rainforests are so lush now. Well, until they're destroyed. And that's funny, I was just looking into, uh, into Chile because I had remembered that they went to expand their Antarctic holdings uh, just a couple years ago. And they bought a bunch of equipment, shipped it all down there, and then everything they owned in Antarctica burnt to the ground. Mm. You're talking metal structures, um, hazmat structures, radiological waste containers and processing um, burnt. Some of these things don't burn but they did and Chile has had a severe bout with fire in the same space of time where their south central um, their south central forest burned and now it's just fields of twisted ash and some shrub is finally coming to life there and it makes me wonder what they're expanding for because it's it hasn't even been 15 years i think since they publicly announced that they had a space program and they've been working at length with with china to develop certain things when you go to google maps and go to chile and take a look at some of those large tracts of land you can see land lined out in grid patterns and it looks like either oil or infrastructure for suburbs about to go in well it, if you could uh, cut to my screen for a second mike actually maybe this would be a good point to do that i'll put a little thing up this is some pictures of when i was in chile <laughs> a few years back or was this last year even that i noticed this part um, Grupo Luxich, and there's a number of mining efforts that go on in Chile. There we go. What, what, what the 10 richest people, families in Chile are doing is they're controlling the mineral resources mostly. And, and agriculture tends to be gold right now. You can sell avocados for a 
tons of money. But when it comes to destroying the land to get lithium out, that's a quick and easy money maker because of the Prius and Tesla and, and in general um, lithium batteries all over the world. But big need for big batteries. So they're carrying out all of these places. And then when they're done, they have to pour the chemicals, you know, onto the land and let it seep into the land. So they, these these crazy deep tunnel systems that they're doing here, I mean, they're they're looking for all sorts of of copper for cobalt. I've, I've seen some of the mineral reports, and you know, it's another example of why the Chilean miners got trapped because they were going so deep, doing such crazy amounts of excavation. And getting stuck underground for thirty days. I mean, there's all sorts of stories about it. I don't need to those go fools. Into that. They're going. Well, I mean, they're going to awaken the Balrog. The Phoenix. The fact that it was named. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that suggest that it was kind of um, there, there's some of it ritualistic or metaphorical, artistically licensed. I mean, the story itself is just too poetic. Let's put it that way. Well, the reality there's... often is, but. These chemical pools, I just wanted to point out, these pools here, that's all mm -hmm. disgusting chemicals that you don't want to touch. That's crazy. Do you know what's going on with copper right now? In terms of prices? In terms, in of, terms of everything, worldwide production. The I mean, do I think about copper more than, I mean, how, how many times a minute does a man think about copper, right? Uh, I, so I've been looking into <laughs> copper this week. <laughs> uh, just as a byline to some other things I was looking at, uh, copper production is hurting right now. And mm -hmm. the prices aren't reflecting yet, but some of the old uh, copper veins and the copper mines, it's not as easy as it was to get this stuff out. And I won't say that's everywhere, but I will say it's a big enough problem that copper recycling is about to see a resurgence, I would say, in the next year. Well, I bet you they're taking copper from people for a lot of reasons. And oh, so, it, oh, yes. They want copper's the most. I don't. I don't oversell it. But copper's very important. There's a reason. Medically. There's a reason that. And now, keep in mind the entire copper industry, for creation of products using copper, ten percent of that comes from recycling. Now, ten percent isn't a whole lot. But when you consider one of the most well-known, one of the most valuable metals that we mine on large scale, 10% is a lot. We've been hurting for copper for long enough that most products are seeing a transition from being pure copper wire to copper coated aluminum wire. And this exists in your washer and your dryer and other things like that. It's still conductive, but it uses just a fraction of the amount of copper that we used to use. We're yeah. getting smarter about it, but we're realizing that copper's not infinite. Also, so, copper is copper's really a powerful thing. It's like, you know, it's a magical oh, yeah. tool. So, for instance, planes now, they're moving away from um, aluminum planes towards carbon fiber airbuses that have thin copper film in the in the carbon fiber so if it's a hit by lightning yeah. or something it will uh, it'll discharge the static electricity yeah it's a monofilament layer i've got a father-in-law works at boeing this is a big reason why the copper is destroying chile and, and the mining is destroying chile is you know uh what you're looking at there is a picture of slag dumping what they're going to do after that cools they're going to bust it up into a million pieces and sell it as concrete geopolymer additive it actually really helps in the setting process of concrete. I'm seeing a good picture of a pollution mining pollution because some of the some of the things look really beautiful. It's the weirdest part. You've got these kind of um, ruins and then these hills and then they've got colors that just well that's not as exciting. But this part you get some of these colors that'll be here. You go. Some of that stuff is just really pretty colorful oh yeah it looks like old faithful of yellowstone <laughs> bloody waters and um yeah just it's i th i found it to be really interesting how much uh work goes into this it takes a lot of their energy and resources and they don't get a lot out back into chile they want i think they know they need to phase out 
this kind of thing because pretty soon there won't be anything left. And I've driven 20 mile or sorry, 20 hours across parts of Chile that nothing grows anymore because it's just all, it just looks like this, you know, for, for Chile used to be dangerous. All of the old tales I've heard of, uh, expeditions and holdings in Chile um, have just been jungles, frost, cannibalism, abandonment, abandonment. I mean, everything is straight Donner pottery. Or yeah, Donner it's, down very, it's very hardcore in some of the, yeah. in, in the very south part, in the O'Higgins part, it's very different. It's a lot colder. But in the north, you know, I feel like a hundred years ago, especially, but in some of these regions in the desert, a lot of those tales of being carried off by giant condors or, gi I mean, seriously, and giants, um, you know, that, that live in the mountains, uh, those those are everywhere. But then, yeah, these crazy harmonic resonant salt piles, they make the, they, they scrape the piles up and then they, uh, up these harmonic resonance pools and, Eventually, they realized that they can use those salt crystals for a lot of things. So lithium is interesting because of the cars. You know, you get 10 miles around these places that they, you want to buy a Prius for the environment, but nothing can grow for 10 miles where it rains because of acid rain. So yeah. it's, it's like lithium is one of the worst possible um, things that we mine for. And they like, you know, also they think what lithium does to the human mind. You know, people love to give people lithium. It's like an electric shock treatment and lithium are two favorite things. But salt, just yeah. regular sodium chloridic salt that it is used in humans, is such a powerful electric conductor. And I think that's something that is being under undersold about all this is that there's actually an effort to get humans um, desalted and, and to take their salts away from them and also the minerals in them and getting away from the copper that's in humans. Um, it's such a wild thing. Everything has a bioelectric signal. I mean, you emit it when you squeeze your forearm, like when you squeeze into a fist. If we were to, if we were to reduce our bioelectric signal enough i mean you want to get onto crazy theories that'd be a death blow to the to the human to the soul there was something we were talking about earlier that was kind of interesting i think this morning we mentioned something about xerox and ctc and i think that that could get into bioelectric stuff pretty fast so I, maybe i should try to re-say that because i thought that was interesting so earlier we were talking about the history of xerox or park research lab so let me open up Park Research Lab first. Park Research Lab Center with the Palo Alto Research Center. And it was created by Xerox. And Xerox was created by IBM. Um, and IBM was originally created by CTC uh, and CTC tabulating company. Let me see if I can find it. pull it up. Made typewriters and cash registers back in the good old days. So what, what happened was a long time ago, they made centralated tabulating company made these machines that were especially useful for cash registers, but then they started working with women's uh, garments. Well, actually just textiles. And they took the textile machine, the codex, uh, you know, cause the code, the code, the way a, a textile works is it's we, it's woven with a pattern, which is actually, um, coded, encoded into the tapestry. They use that same system to do a census for the United States and for the Soviet Union. Uh, maybe even before the Soviet Union, I can't remember, but they did a European census and an American census. This this was when CTC became IBM, and they switched over from being you know centrally a tabulating company to you know being this international business machines company, so they could sell things around the world and. The next step, you know, military and government contracts, because census, you know, work was and the government needed these big numbers to be accurately me measured. Also interesting is their like logo. So CTC, IBM, IBM eventually doing government machines had vacuum tube systems and these vacuum tube systems were being used with electric magnetic memory, electric magnetic memory that was done by Memex, Vannevar, uh, Vannevar Bush, is that how you spell that? Van Van Ever, Van Ever, Van Ever Bush, 
was not to be confused with W. Bush, but if you want to, you can. But he's a very interesting man, and he said, I saw nothing at Roswell, but I had a great idea. Let's invent the internet and electromagnetic memory systems, and eventually we'll be able to upload our minds onto the internet through a thing I'll call, I don't know, Xanadu. So he's kind of interesting, and about six months after him and his old Magic MJ-12 team uh, were in New Mexico, things like Memex and the MOSFET semiconductor came out just like, it's very Terminator, you know, like we found the chip and we got it out. Um, so that was very important for IBM because then the government was like, cool, we have a product for you to use. But IBM needed um, first to, uh, to digitize this information in a way that they could see. They said, all right, well, we need printers. So somebody had an idea to make a printer for IBM and they said, this machine is way too cool for you to, to control. And, and I actually think IBM themselves said, I don't think we have the resources to focus on this. So it spun off into its own company, Xerox. And I wish I could remember off the top of my head, the joke, what the name comes from. Because it doesn't mean it's ditto. Because you know, they started making dittos. It was like their, their um, Xerox history. The, Her the Halloid Photographic Company, founded in 1906, manufactured paper equipment, photographic paper equipment. So this was their um, ditto <laughs> company machine, and it made duplicates, you know, in uh, carbon copies. In 1938, Chester Carlson, a physicist working independently, invented a process for printing images using an electrically charged photoconductor-coated metal plate and dry powder toner. However, it would take more than 20 years of refinement before the first automated machine to make copies was commercialized using a document feeder, scanning light, and a rotating drum. It was Joseph C. Wilson, credited as the founder of Xerox, who took over Halloween from his father. He saw the promise of Carlson's invention in 1946. That's the magic year. Signed an agreement to develop it as a commercial product. Wilson remained as president and CEO of Xerox until 1967. So, right there, they didn't really say where um, where the name. So they changed it to Halloid Zero. Oh, there it is. Okay, Halloid coined the term xerography from two Greek root words meaning dry writing. There it is, right there. Xerography is the dry photocopying technique. It is a. Oh, let's look at this picture. By the way, xerography. That's that's a like. I'm saving that. I like that. Um, xerography is the dry photocopying technique, fundamental principle invented by American physicist Chester Carlson, and based on Hungarian physicist Pal Seni's publication. Oh, who's this guy? 1884, wouldn't you know it, father of xerography and the Tungsram, Tungsram Corporation, the largest, oldest, internationally most prestigious firm known for producing light bulbs and electronics in Budapest, Hungary. Wow, this is a much better Wikipedia page. Notice how the Hungarians are able to do stuff. Uh, give them some credit when it's due. I'm pretty impressed. Uh, the Tungs from our MX radio bulb. So this is interesting because it's a company that commanded tungsten, clearly. you know, And not just that. Some this RAM part makes me think of Rama. So the energy that, you know, light energy that's being produced by tungsten. And tungsten is kind of um Uh, often confused with gold. They, they mix, there's a lot of uh, gold that has tungsten in it. Yeah, but tungsten is, is even more dense than gold and mercury, both. Uh, yeah, they use it for weaponry. You've heard about the tungsten rods, right? Oh, they yeah. yeah. Throwing rods from the sky. Well, that's, that's a funny thing. Um, let's get crazy here. The electrical discharge from a body entering our atmosphere would destroy that tungsten. It would splinter it. Hmm. And I mean like a million micro splinters. So this tungsten rod has to be launched from upper atmosphere. I don't think it could even leave the atmosphere. Little segue into do we have a space or not. But yeah, that <laughs> you know that's going to be an interesting. Uh, it's going to be an interesting week for me because I'm meeting up with several people that are quite, uh, you know, like the 
the the, the the conspiracy guru guy who does the songs and um and and also stellium are, are both pretty pretty adamant on on um but on an on an on, on due course they have evidence they've shown some pretty important things with, with evidence and i think it would be a disservice for anyone to just ignore that there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that make it hard for me to play with uh with with that reality if we lived let's say completely in just this like simulation where we're in a dome like and that's all it is i feel like that would that would make it difficult to play with a lot of this other level of electrostatic theory for some people though and I, and that's why i think it's a little bit more holographic than that so it's described in space time like as a as a moment but otherwise it could be looked at as a mobius strip and I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure if you called the universe a Mobius strip, it would offend less people. I don't know why, but that seems the way things are headed. So at the same time, I wonder, is it matter? And maybe it does. Like maybe maybe we're supposed to be offensive. Like why is it like that they're trying to come, like ease us into b believing that something far away uh, is coming? And why, you know, because they're talking about the, the, this new meteor that's headed towards Earth. Oh, the god, the god comet, or the chaos god—I think it's named, or something, something like that. Like NASA wants us to be concerned with this, you know, this imminent like National Enquirer esque movie threat. And it's like, okay, but NASA, NASA wants us, and I won't say any more on this because it's such a huge subject. NASA wants us to believe that there are stringent qualifications and criterion for putting a man in space. And then they put out a fat man in space. His name is Tingle. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And they also want us to believe space. that no one is on wires in their space videos. They're really bad at it. it it's ruining the space idea. It could have validity, but not if you're watching NASA. Yeah, you know, I think that's another funny thing. They used to have really bad um, television that was like, I remember back in 2001 or some three, there was like to six, there was just like rocket launch videos that didn't look very convincing at all. I was like, wait, is this old? Or like, what's going on? Or like, is NASA doing rockets? Or and you, you know, if you press for it, you find out that they're like, yeah, we don't really, we're just testing this old thing. And now you just, it's, there's plenty of, of footage. It's just all really artistic. Like you said, it's a very high production values. Like they're trying to do a uh, Disney's uh, kids surfing news show you know they're like oh yeah it's amazing what you can do with your drinking tang upside down like what is the whole point of that and we I mean, just swallow the toothpaste i don't really uh, i don't really know if maybe the point is to get people to not believe in it though because they're like they don't want you to think that it's a it, is it is it safer for for people to dismiss it and then all of a sudden to be destroyed by it or is it it's easier for people to be possessed by something they believe is outside than inside? Because inner space is, you know, essentially a, a more tra traumat traumatizing concept for some reason, that, they're, that the demons can be all around us or something like that. It seems a little bit scarier somehow than extraterrestrials. And maybe it's because they have a commanding ability to turn it inside out and say, oh, this isn't the same thing. It's, it's an alien and it's, you know, it's E.T. and it's safe. So maybe well, that's a good part. I think a large part of that is you are less inclined to be up in arms about everything or anything if everything is boring. Mm -hmm. And so what is the world? There are no gods, there are no demons, religion isn't real, space is so far away from us being in it as a people that everything just goes back to boring. So you turn on your television and watch American Idol. And I watched that the latest, um, the latest SpaceX launch and they cut away from the landing of the main rocket. They were landing all three after they launched them. They were looking at the launch pad and then the feed cut and then it cut back on and the, the main rocket had landed on the ship and the clouds are completely different. And I was like, damn it. No. 
I hated that I was looking for something. Nair Lothotep. Yes, sir. I've got some. Did we already do. Did I talk at all about uh, the old Mother Hubbard thing? No, tell it. Okay, so I was thinking, like, we're looking into these old stories, <laughs> and some of these old stories are really, like, obviously about Tartaria. And some of the. The, the best examples is like they're being augmented by cultures, but you get some of the stuff like is just impossible to ignore. And one of the ones I liked a lot, I think, was um, Mother Goose, because Mother Goose you'd think would be from Britain, right? But then, like, you know, there's like a story that Mother Goose's son had her arrested and published her, uh, her stories to show that she was. Um, like an anti-royalist but then there's like so many examples like there's so charles perrault was perrault was a royalist in the french court who wrote mother goose stories and then edmund spencer was an english poet who supposedly had the exact same story and that's the one i had heard it happened to but then i found out that there's actually another miss hubbard in the americas that was in the 1690s supposedly um so where are you going to find this mother goose thing? But it's like, it could very well be true. I mean, Isaac goose, like Isaac is, you know, the name there. There's, there's a lot to this, like ver goose looking into the story of the goose and like Von goose. Well, goose got me thinking about Nostradamus and Madame Blavatsky. Cause they tell stories that are about these, you know, anthropomorphic, animals that are you know there's there's a certain amount of prophecy that's hidden in there and that made me think of nostradamus and madame blavatsky also because um Bielich means um, squirrel and so madame b so i was thinking about madame blavatsky and moose and squirrel were probably the hollywood interpretations of some of these old myths the way they've been augmented in a way that like you're not supposed to really recognize them but they're so clear you know and so right in front of your eyes you can tell that they're like about these old things i think we've already talked about disney being a resicrucian and he was really interested in trying to get all this kind of information out into the public well he made rocky and bullwinkle and it doesn't say walt disney productions on it but it's because he created rko pictures distributor alternative Buena Vista. You know, he wanted to get out of the Hollywood controlling his picture distribution. So he started this company called Buena Vista Pictures and in the name of his kids and while they were like like still young. And then by the time they were like 18 or multimillionaires for running it. And the main thing that it first did was it produced Rocky and Bullwinkle. So it didn't have a Disney name, but it was such a weird cartoon. And it has, you know, epic fables about um, you know, like uh, the the mouse and the lion is the the old fractured fairy tales about um, eating nightshades and then Cinderella, um, but there's there's also like the law of equivalence. So there's there's the moose and the squirrel, and then there's Nostradamus and there's Madame Blavatsky. You know, there's this Boris and Natasha like character that are the equal and opposite of the Belchka squirrel and of Nostradamus. And also, yeah, Nostradamus, like, it seems like Our Lady's Moose, you know? So that connected to the idea of the tower that's been destroyed. So I know I'm taking philosopher's license, but that was something I thought I wanted to bring up. Damn, Mike, tiny tunes were Mike, great. God damn it, Mike. I didn't ask you to, to get my screen selected, huh? <laughs> No, but I've been paying attention, so I've been sharing it at the right times. Oh yeah, you got the squirrel. Cool. That's all I wanted. I got the squirrel. I got Rocky and Bullwinkle. I got the Tartarian straight right in front of your eyes. Stuff. We're good. We're good. Cool. I really like this picture of the the, the squirrel, and so I just wanted to make sure. 
<laughs> there you go. Everyone can see it. So, Nathan, did you hear about well, um, Lee's? Is there what, where's Victor? Is Victor? Did you already? Did you, can you oh. not hear me, Andreas? Uh, Victor's talking right now. Can you hear him? No. Oh. Am I am I only able to hear like you and Nathan? I'm pretty sure so far. I haven't heard anybody speak but you and Nathan. Oh no. Should I perhaps rejoin? Oh, okay. Him? So I should get out of this group and start over. Wait a sec, Andreas. You s okay? <laughs> so you have, you guys can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, gets yeah. edited, right? You can hear me. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hey Lee. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Lee, I like can your. Can you hear me now, Andreas? Oh my gosh! Do so you mean the whole time was I talking back. to people a lot? It's embarrassing. Um, it happens. I hear, you, I hear you, Victor. What's up? Okay, good. So it's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> there was a whole lot. I'll have to uh, rewatch a lot of it to uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, earlier today, me and well, Mike, Lee, and I were talking in Discord, and Lee mentioned this um, idea. Lee, do you wanna do you wanna talk um, about it? Yeah, sure. Thank you for uh, bringing it up. Well, I, just, I ha it's just simple, really, because I, I was thinking, you know, I've noticed how the fascies resembles um, like co like like a cable, like you know, it has insulation, it it has a different aspects, different layers. And I'm, I was kind of thinking that maybe the fascies themselves were a kind of modular cable, something that could be connected end to end as a power cable, or um, but also as a battery or a weapon. So it, I, I reckon they, they probably had multiple purposes, but the way I see it is that there could be, the way it's been designed seems to be something that allows uh, energy or an electrical charge to travel through it um, simply because of the, the shape and the way it's been put together. I don't really understand too much about electronics and stuff like that, but all you need to do really is put some metal together and you've got a circuit, isn't it? So something like that anyway. And I'm just kind of thinking, well, if they, if you had an army full of people each carrying a fascist and they were all in formation and then you wanted to very quickly uh, assemble this uh, cable of some, or, uh, for whatever purpose what you'd have to do is get them in formation just to lay it down and put it together and it'd be it'd be you know it's like a, a portable energy source and if it's uh coming from the ether or or, or, or free energy or that's all around us uh that's even more interesting it, it seems like uh you could probably uh, use it for many purposes so i, I thought that was very interesting uh Coincidence I think, that yeah. they resemble each other. It's but very I'm sure it has enough a good, uh, a mm -hmm. good enough, uh, In, Imagine being able to assemble them. You know, you carry a lot of fascies, as we have seen on the many picture, uh, depictions, to a battlefield, and then you stack them, um, and then you create like this long, long fascies, amplified power, or focus power, or concentrated power. Um, I, I just imagine that would be. Yeah, uh, doable. And but if the uh, fascies isn't the circuit itself, it completes the circuit. Like you're carrying right. around a fuse. Yes, it, I and think it acts as a battery as well. You know, it's gonna it's gonna probably contain perhaps a charge of its own anyway. Do you think the fascies and the onk as kind of correlated symbols? Because I kind of yes. do at this point. And yes, the yes. ang was probably one of the symbols that were. Um, venerated to a large extent. I kind of imagine the fascist. that the fascist is a sort of a tool that works for the. Um, imagine maybe that the the onk needs a fascist to for the energy source. Uh, uh, imagine the way that. Wait, that exists. You know, I've seen there's some, when you see the staffs on um, on hieroglyphs, you can see these gods holding the onk or their various tools but they're also holding the rod and the rod wound with copper and you see them hold it 
at different spots in the rod, which works exactly like a crystal radio. Hmm. You're interrupting you're interrupting the coil's length with your hand and therefore changing the uh, the flow of electricity. So you're you're tuning it by holding it where you hold it. And so you can see them holding it at the halfway mark, a third of the way up, a third of the way from the top, all of that. So, I mean, pre-fascies, the rod is the Egyptian fascies, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're just like, a, yeah, I kind of imagine they work together. Like that the, but maybe they are, you know, at one point they were one thing, but there's something about the fascies that seems like it's, it's more of a the like the energy source or like the supercapacitors wound up. You could have a lot of energy stored up in these um, pieces, and then that could power with the onk could either spin. I think the onk is the electromagnetic um, center of um, of a of, an, of a fan or a turbine. So you know, either a generator or a fan. What if? Uh, you guys, besides Mike, might not be familiar with Warhammer 40K, but I love it. So does Mike. Oh, sure. <laughs> but every ship has a command throne, and usually the ship's captain is built into it. They're one with this command chair. Now imagine if... What's that fort called? That big one? The bl oh, Blackstone, never mind. The Blackstone Fortress and the Ramillies class star forts. But what if any throne in any throne room required that the two guards holding the fasces plug them in to create essentially a power chair, a golden throne, and just mm. a simple connection of the circuit? So if the if the pharaoh or the king or the emperor says turn the temple on his two lifeguards plug the fasces in oh yeah that's very interesting could be like an external power source yes and that means that his his honor guard or lifeguard they take the power with them wherever they go yeah and that all there has to be is a magnet surrounded by flat wound or round wound conductive material i like your idea lee by the way yeah yeah absolutely thank you i mean i, I got it from our uh, i first it first came to me when i was watching Mark Sinequia. He's uh, made a lot of discoveries. He was the person I first found out about the fascists from. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so you know, I, I, I just look, I just remember looking at it and just thinking, well, it looks like it looks like you can put them together end to end. And if that was the case, why would they do that? Oh, what if it's a cable of some kind, like a, an old fashioned, just it was just their form of a of a cable or, or some kind of uh, conduit. In which to channel energy so i mean the axe itself i'm not really sure how that would fit into it but um i mean it could be that the act the axe blade acted as some kind of earth earthing or grounding aspect um that might be necessary yeah. I, I don't know i don't really understand it at that. least sometimes i've seen uh, it's called the labris uh, sometimes it's a double-headed axe sometimes it's just one-sided axe it seems but um, it's called um, a labris, and it has this weird modality of being somehow uh, technological and also uh, a moon calendar. Um, very interesting. Right. Um, but I have a picture or depiction of um, an old monument where a labris is used as the finial or the antenna on the building. So that, to me, at least suggests that uh, that form it also resembles the um, the inverted crescent that you see on a lot of um, finial and antennas um, on churches so I, I think it has to do with um, 
whatever the finials are doing. And so that would be something to do with atmospheric electricity, primarily, I think. Or at least it has that modality. And what, what, why, why, why it would be um, used uh, on the fascists, I have no idea still. I think that it may have been symbolic then. If, if we continue in the vein that a fascist completes the circuit, turns the architecture on, then it wouldn't be used all the time or even frequently. So that head would be removable. It would be ornamental. Or there symbolic. might be like this, um, it might be that it has this metallic rod <laughs> Um, as an axe would have, and then you, you know, make it go back and forth to create some type of energy excitation. Could be. Um, that has been put forward uh, by Martin. And, but, uh, but yeah, we don't know. <laughs> and sometimes the fascist um, has all sorts of other types of spears and axe heads and swords. In it, it's weird. Right. It could have been a multi-purpose, um, a multi-purpose object that that could link. Uh, yeah, that could be a, a weapon, a battery, a cable, anything that you know, anything that links to the architecture. Um, and later on, just a symbol. Once people forgot. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the the other aspect that the Tartarians or at least the Scythians, I think were nomads um, or the Mongolia, I don't know which one, uh, they're all the same basically, aren't they? So um, if they were nomads and they were going from place to place, the likelihood of needing a portable object of some kind would be much more uh, mm. valid. So, and and also I think yeah. Victor did mention earlier during our conversation about how things like uh, organs and other uh, types of uh, musical instruments or, or things like that that were built into the architecture itself perhaps were actually a method or a way of manipulating the frequency or the energy itself and directing it in a sense so that was you won't find that <coughs> well, I guess you won't it find that anywhere more than you will find that in India that's mm -hmm. almost all I've been seeing in the past month is the tunability of rock the singing rocks that you find in uh, Pennsylvania you can hit them and they ring, but when you remove them right. from the area, like they crystal don't ring. resonating crystal glasses. Yes, there's even um, there's even Shiva's musical instrument, which is a rock the size of a two bedroom house, and Ooh, it rings. Very really interesting. It has something that also looks like a fascist too, like a, a double drum, double headed drum type of thing as well, doesn't he? Yes. So I was thinking just now about graphene and supercapacitors because you're talking. If I I, will, I, don't, I get the whole decorative thing, but like, if I had the way I live my life is I've got an electronic device and I have a battery. You know what I mean? So you've got this like machine that you got to plug into places. So you've got supercapacitors, which are kind of like batteries, but what they are are the little stacks over and over again that are in the fascies and when they're all bound together, you know, they can be used like in unison. They can be easily hit with a little bit of light and then the light will then cause an electrical charge. So this can, you can swap them. Basically you can plug your device in to a new battery section, you know? So maybe that could be a reason why you take your arm off of your fascies because it's like, it's disconnectable and you can replace that part, you know, every time because it could be storing energy with salt crystals or, chemicals from water and vinegar you know there might be ways that they were using those that were a lot more sophisticated mm. than just chemical batteries and c capacitors are more interesting than batteries because of the, the electromagnetic quality from the light like the radiation from the sunlight makes it just polarize and then you have collections of energy that you can charge instantly that's interesting um, we're not thinking about something the fascies are bound rods. <laughs> mm -hmm. What if you just take them apart? Well, then you what have each individual. Bound like that? Each what individual if they're bound like that to be taken apart regularly? Well, they're not telling me that they 
if each of them are magnetized, then they actually could be used, um, say, two fasces, each is bound by eight rods on the outside. So you've got 16 plus the two main rods. You could create a magnetic field array, an antenna array. Mm. If you're in the field, unbind the fasces and just hammer them into the ground. Interesting. So if we talk about mobile power, <clears throat> there's a solution. Well, everything about batteries is fascistic. Like, I don't know if you're sharing, Mike, but if you could show my screen. The idea of a battery uh, unit is essentially that you want to take as many cells as possible and attach them together. Um, this is, you know, often done in a pretty square-looking way these days, but deep down you know it's not. It's 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 all done in these in these uh, sphere like fascistic spheres. Um, also, the old computers are, are in the in the old days were done that way as well. Like the Cray, I think it's called um, Cray computer. Is that right? They did this at an at an angle fascistically as well. These computers were designed to have yes. everything at a, at a circular point so that you could get in the center of it. And you know you could be the axe head, and you can move from one point to the other point. They're all at a close uh, uh, attachment. And easy Damn, name. that's cray. So cray, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, even with separating the fasces, you could link those together with metal wire yes. and increase the field area, thereby increasing strength and power in some instances. But you can also, yeah, it's true. You could separate it theoretically, although it would be crazy to do. That you could. It, it wouldn't be cray like that. Yeah. Look at that. That's pretty cray. But um, if you had, say, you had gone to a place with a strong magnetic field, the earth is full of these ley lines, hammer them into the ground and absorb more ambient energy, mm -hmm. and then the central rod of each fasces would be a collection point. And we always talk about these aerials all of these towers that go up, what if you needed these in the field for communication? If you're an army on the march or yes. a general. Yes. Faces. You know, the, the, other, the other faces. You just search faces. I do like that band. Um, the other thing is like a fascist is, is clearly decorative to me because this is not the most convenient axe head. Like you could use, like you notice people that use axes don't use fascists. Like most people have like a, a decent axe head that's like a decent tree branch that's like a specific kind of tree branch. Um, see, here's like a tree branch with an axe attached to it. Like this is this is decorative or an actual tool for some other purpose. Like someone wanted to unroll a mat. Like there's some other reason that you've got all of these beams here than just to hold a giant bundle of sticks while you're swinging an axe. Like it just doesn't physically. Nope, seem that's cool. the only way an axe works. It's more comfortable to use just like a, you know, this guy right here. Just nope, that I, my axes all have bundles of sticks. You love bundles of sticks? I would try it. <laughs> I would like to try it. I, would, I shouldn't knock it until I've tried it. But this guy, look at him right here. He looks like he's a, he could lose a finger. I mean. Yeah. I get your point. No, there's no way. Yeah, no, sorry. I'm looking at it and I've decided. There's no way that this was designed to ever be used for the convenience of having a bunch of sticks bundled together. Of course. <laughs> so what about the people who want to see it as just like this overly grotesque X that you just swing around with? Yeah, not. That's my point. Like, it's whoever said that is an intellectual and not an actual axeman. And an, an actual axeman will tell you that that's ridiculous and go out and try it. You know, unless they're the, <laughs> yeah. a good person, in which case they tell you, please don't. But there's something decorative. I think we'll all admit, everyone in history class will admit that this was about solidarity. This was about unison. Each one of these staffs represented a staff from somebody. I don't know if it's Yeah, from, a rod or scepter of power from one of the might not uh, be city from, states. Right. It might not be so from the states. soldiers. It might not be from the conscripted soldiers. It might be from the conquered city states. Yes. Each uh, clan leader. But it also <laughs> looks like a musical, 
right there. <laughs> it does. It, it has. It looks like a rowdy pan flute. It it looks like a machine gun, like a Gatling gun. You know, it looks like a lot of um, futuristic artillery. It looks also like copper pipes or gold pipes. You know, pipes that could have been used for all sorts of right. things. It's the way it's arranged. All of those, all of those uh, mm -hmm. tubes next to each other, you know, bound together, and then the central tube. It's just something very. You know, we, we base our own fucking wires. Sorry, excuse my language. We base our technology on, on very similar, very similar principles. When we compare it to things like fiber optic cables and stuff, it's just, it's just. I just could get over the the resemblance. And please get in the duck. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for thanks for doing that. Actually, because that helps. You know, <laughs> I would have probably almost just lost it if it weren't for that. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, you're right. Also, I mean, you're you're ducking right because look at the look at the uh, the leather strap around it on top of everything else is like a mitzvah. It's like what you you bound a hand in the morning. You bind your hand when you're doing a mitzvah. With this cow uh, leather strap, and they're doing it to this weapon here, which is you know being you being made into a tool that can't be used as a weapon anymore. It's just carried around symbolically. To point out, you know, that, it, that it, they're more powerful because of it together. So, well, yeah, you could understand why that is a very well, good explanation it, for think about why the it's object. Just political. It's not just political. That's what I'm trying to say, right? It's like why it's a supercapacitor, a battery, is more powerful when you bind it together, like battery bank let's type in battery not to the bank sounds like the wrong kind of thing battery bank so a battery bank and i've built a few of these can kill you because if you if you have all of the energy and then a solar panel runs through you know let's say 600 milliamp hours it's even enough to kill you probably your prius can kill you you know not mine because i don't have one thank god but these things have to have a discharge bank so you have a bank of batteries empty so that if too much energy flows out, it flows into the other bank and doesn't explode because there needs to be a place for it to go. So, I mean, the, essentially, they're not lying to you when they say they're stronger together because it's literally each one of them you know, accumulated is stronger together. But I think that there, there, there might be more to it than just some um, – uh propaganda message i think they're literally trying to say like look you can get a whole bundle of super capacitors together and you can attach it to an onk right so where's that fact he's on it's on something there, really um well let's go to, go to a picture of an onk. have you guys seen the fascies at oxford university uh send me that show that uh want to show nathan yeah, I forgot how to screen share. Um, here's the button. The green arrow thingy. And now I'm sharing. Here we go. Look at that. Oh, yeah, it points. Whoops. What did I just do? Where are you? What am I looking at? I can't see. I'm it. looking at the. Am I sharing the screen? Oh, yeah, I'm Mike, seeing it coming Mike, out of the yeah, lines. The right. line with the fascist coming out of its mouth. Mike, yeah, it click on like it. Looks like it's plugged in like a key. Mm -hmm. Right, or, yeah, so like a plug. Like, like, like a socket. It's just weird. The... And you know, in the, on the, in the images of the fascist, the lion actually does appear as an additional element of the ornamental ones, in addition to the, uh, to the, to the axe. I've seen mm -hmm. a few pictures with a little lion attached to it too. I, I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, I have an example of it, Lee, on a hydraulic, um, where you can see that where they have mounted small little statues of baby angels that they you would you would be able to screw off the statue and underneath it there would be a pump um, or a chamber. So it's very. Um, it, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's a good idea that you could have ornaments, you know, covering up uh, the technology. Right. I mean, the lion is also, I mean, it's an extremely symbolic thing. I mean, it, it, in... Uh, the lion is the sun. 
light oh, yeah. is the ultimate right. symbol of electrical power in that sense it's the solar power the sun. it's also it's also meant to be the form in which yaudabaoth and the archons take you know the lion with the serpent body yeah and a uh, leo always pays being a representation oh. of, of what mag magnetism or magnetic fields or was it plasma energy Oh, yeah. And, and if you think about it, all this talk about reptilian archons and, you know, these beings possessing human skin, and then you suddenly you see those slit eyes coming forth. What if uh, the reptile is a cover up for a cat's eye? Hmm. Could be. They're very, they kind of quite similar. They, they have nearly the same. And you, and you see all the sexual depravity. Cats are known to be, you know, very sexual. And especially lions are known to have this very homosexual tendency where they even, you know, well, the archons uh, raped kill each and other. violated Eve. That in Nakamadi, the archons were very lustful and uh, they desired Eve because she was beautiful um, and, and she resembled the image that they saw in the water, reflected in the water. Um, and they desired her and then they, they violated her, basically. So it would make sense, you know, they're basically very lustful creatures that had no, no qualms about raping people. Yeah, they, they would be um, Jupiterians in that sense, as we know, um, learning about Zeus and his sexual appetite is one of the... Yeah, but at that, same, at that same time, women stories shift, right? So then you go for, so that's interesting, because in the in the Uyghur, Uyghur times in Africa, in the Barbers, in the Tartar times, there are, you know, in the ancient pre-Egyptian times, there are these tales of women who have been abused, and then they end up becoming judges of men, which is an interesting thing. Like, the court systems that we have today, we wear wigs in Britain. You know, they do this because of the Egyptians, because of the women. So it's a, it's a cross-dressing cult. But then at the same it's, time... It's denoting the lunar astrology that is still in power and has been ever since the flood, the biblical flood, that then, would have happened in the age of cancer, which would be... They change the, it after it's gone to heliocentric though, isn't after it? they after they change after the <laughs> after they change though i think i forget i'm sorry victor is it go from cancer to leo or how does it work with the it's leo yeah. no it'll go backwards won't it so it'll be gemini okay so this is funny they would go gemini because the next step after this story yeah, shift exactly in the, it would go from part. water to air so the minute the minotaur the minotaur uh stories right so the king king midas and you've got daedalus and his son icarus is that right am i getting the names right so i want to read the story out so you've got this maze and you've got this wife of this king who wants to um evade her uh, the king wants to keep the wife safe and he wants to keep his his family away from anything dangerous and she so builds this uh maze um to keep oh let's let's get to the beginning here oh you broke got, grab a bit can you hear me hello can you hear me you're good here yeah it, okay yeah so the so the they build the he's got a minotaur to defend the maze and his wife decides to build a bodysuit to look like a bull so that she can get the minotaur to have sex with her because she finds this minotaur to be more virile and enticing than her husband and then you know in order to do that she she has to get the same guy who built the maze for her husband for the minotaur to build her the suit so it's like then the king's really annoyed because he's like i built this maze in order to protect everyone from the minotaur and i paid this guy to do it but then the same guy i ended up my wife paid you know to to get with the thing i was trying to protect everybody from um, so then Daedalus is all afraid for his life, so he has to like build a pair of wings for him and his son, and then they fly off. But when they fly over the sea, they fly too high, and he's like, don't fly any higher because you're getting too close to the sun. And he falls to, you know, son Icarus falls when his wings melt to the sea. But it's, a, it's an Athenian myth that comes from the next period because it's a switching. So it's interesting that it's Gemini because all of a sudden you've got this quantum psychology story of a king who is trying to keep his, uh, his, his, his ego safe. 
So he's got this kingdom, which is his ego. And the, the, the feminine, the recessive part of him, it needs this virile masculinity, but he's taken his masculinity and he's sequestered it. He's put it in a maze. So you got this minotaur, which is his primal essence, you know, his essential masculinity. So then she needs that. So she goes for it. In order to get that, she has to disguise herself. And, you know, he's, he's even got, you know, the intelligent aspect of himself is Daedalus. But then once he learns how to cope with this destruction and, you know, he becomes the sun, the sun going towards the actual sun and the sun in Athenian mythology is God. So reaching the Godhead destroys him when he becomes one with the Godhead and he can't actually become one with the Godhead. So he falls into the sea and the sea is Poseidon, which is, you know, the, the, the whole flood myth, you know. I'm stuck on fascies again, which. Oh, wait, when we're, can you share the screen for a second? Also, we're talking about fascies I wanted to show. So here's my thought about the Ankh having um, fascies actually used in the center here. And you just, you, oh, a, yeah. Attach it in. That's the symbol right there. You see that tiny rod in the middle? Yeah. That's a depiction of, of a full size rod, which the they rod think is used mm -hmm. as tuning. Oh yeah, that uh, think That's about um, the comfort of the rod. The Lord comforts me mm -hmm. with his staff. So, uh, huh. so yeah, what's all that about? But right? um, who's comforted with a staff? They beat you with a staff. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, comfort. But it, um, on the old tarot deck, you see the hermit. Uh, the hermit carries a staff. Um, mm -hmm. It is very much um, connected to Aquarius and the air and the uh, air transmissions and therefore also electricity. But um, yeah, I wanted to also make a symbol into a device today, just as mm -hmm. you have done, Andreas, with the ink or tried to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try as well. Um, so I'm going to screen share um, your entire screen. Yes. Okay, so just tell me when you're seeing when what I'm seeing. So are you, um, are you uh, seeing Mike, my screen? Mike, share your screen. Mike? Oh, is Mike there? Is that it? There we go. Oh, so you're seeing the higher fan cross now. Yep, yep. Yes. Yeah. So this cross... Um, has been, and there you go again with the sign of benediction. Um, but this cross is um, very important in symbology and you'll see many people having all sorts of meanings for this. And I've always wondered what exactly was the meaning behind having, you know, a double cross, a triple cross and a single cross. Hmm. Um, the crowns in the legal world would represent the the free um, sestiqui uh, trusts that the papal, uh, you know, the free papal bulls that mm -hmm. came out um, 500 approximately years ago. Um, so yeah, so what's up with this? So I found this on Gallica. And um, before I show you, it's just like this weird assembly of people Yes. Uh, and and they're looking at all there's all weird imagery here it's a pyramid free suns astronomical phenomena mermaid could be phoenician um uh, i don't know and then there's, there's an athenar so it's definitely alchemical uh, knowledge in this and here you go Whoa, this dude. guy's this guy is holding the the triple cross or the hierophant's cross and he's basically using it as a telescope. Yeah, or aerial. Like it kind of almost looks like an aerial antenna. Well, yeah, if I had a better version, you could see that he's actually closing one of his eyes. Oh, okay. He is, yeah. So yeah, he's looking, yeah. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah. So, so and I thought to myself, right. this makes sense now because this is the hierophant. It's the it's a high position of knowledge. Would he would know the script of the stars, 
And uh, mm -hmm. this is the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction, which is very important for human affairs and power to know those cycles. And how does he know that cycle? By this. Just like Gulliver's Travels. Wow. That's very interesting, very astute observation so the, to be able to see. And this cross is very old. We don't know how old this could be. So Galileo Galilei and his telescopes can, for my sake, um, bugger off. Wow. Yeah, okay. I was thinking it could also be, you know, you could think of it as a metaphor that it's like he's able to see using it. But it's actually that it's like an aerial antenna that's electrical and like, like look at this. No it has it. this. I, I was looking for possible telescopic instruments. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's. A I was looking for. Um, I was looking for possible optical instruments that has this um, focusing cross around. section within them, and I've had a hard time locating examples of. No, I mean that's, oh that was goodness. that was. But so I found perfect. this to be that quite um, yeah. close. Okay, yeah that no i think i've actually seen at some point a focusing rod like it wasn't even a kaleidoscope but looked like a kaleidoscope like that but oh, you can no, use you it you know focus. what those are this um, is in minerals yeah well that's in a kaleidoscope i think that sorry mike continue oh this is an organite device that's all i wanted to say your turn <laughs> An organized oh, device. Wait, 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 wait. Can the you explain, explain the... I want to go back. Mike, explain an organized device. Using, using the kaleidoscope and shining light through it into your eyes is an organized device? Because that's fascinating. Nathan is far better at explaining orgone than I am. Uh, okay, I'll screen share. But is that what you're saying? Are you, you're saying that a kaleidoscope tool shines light through organite into your eyes, and then that's good for you? I was on the same type of thing. Um, the kaleidoscope is a oh, purely breaking up and like, again. Who me or him? I'm not talking. Oh, it's really bad now. Maybe you should um, rejoin. Okay, here we go. To, to see how orgone and organ <laughs> goes together quite neatly. Do you see this? Spain. Hello? Hello. Oh. Is it better? Yeah, I've seen, I'm seeing it. Wow. Yeah. Now, orgone is just another word we all know this when i say no uh, just imagine quotations around it it's an ion displacement device that's it it just encourages the movement of free ions when you put them in the ground completely separate now imagine you have and i'm just running with mike's orgone idea as a kaleidoscope you're engaging in an amateur attempt to filter the light, which is where I was going with your Hierophant's cross. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Hierophant's cross looks like a spyglass. And could you possibly turn one of the crossbars inside and thereby filter out different types of light? Mm -hmm. Because you know it would be hellish to look at the sun or to look at the moon unfiltered. That's pretty interesting. And so if the Hierophant's cross, as Victor showed, is a spyglass, then it would only make sense that those crossbars are filters. And you just dial in the filter and... Sorry, I've got sirens. Your ideas are too good. We're coming for you. I think a plane went down not far from here because I saw some weird spirally contrails. You ha you've had oh. too much to think. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking time's over, son. No, there's um. Nathan, have you been playing with your organite devices again? You shouldn't point these at aeroplanes. Come on, you know that. No, you just plant. One of these. 
That's a silly one. Hammer some copper stakes uh, in the ground with such closed devices? end at the bottom. Yeah, a couple small ones. Um, wow. Think of them. Think of them like directional ion cannons or ion guns. It's gonna stream free ions in the open direction. You point this at a person, they'll have a bad day. There's your witchcraft angle. But people have been getting into trouble, a lot of trouble, putting these things at the base of 5G towers. <laughs> and they can't get in any legal trouble because they're hidden, but um, it's, it's generally frowned upon. Do you think it's doing a lot of good now? It's like, is it worth a shot? I mean, it's well, it's enough. It's enough to disrupt the field. That's pretty cool. Oh, hello. Oh, if you yeah. can, if you can redirect, hello, Brittany. I have a question. I was going to ask. It. Okay, so you're talking about shooting things out of the sky with orgone devices, and so that's like Wilhelm Reich in Contact with Space when he aims his orgone. Uh, energy device. He allegedly shoots something out of the sky, and it's right around uh, the time when all the UFOs were being supposedly discovered. Wow. That are and uh, 1951, 52, 53, 54 is the time when he finally decided to turn the device on the anomalies in the sky. And what happened to the people operating? the organator, it's, that's not what it's called, but um, would have seizures. Uh, one person supposedly turned a different color for a couple days. And um, that book, the you can get it now, but when I bought it, it was like, I don't know, $1,500 is what people were asking for it. So I ended up just putting in a low ball bid and explaining that I'd spent too much money on books or whatever. So I did get a copy of it and it's, I've just been trying to almost link the dates um, to some of the, you know, the the, the fines, because he might have accidentally like shot down friendly, not not friendly. I don't know spy those um. I don't know what you call those the machines the I guess UFOs, but the disc devices that he could yeah. have just destroyed. A tall tale of Space Gun Fifty Four. <laughs> there we go. Wow. But I, I I was trying to link that for a couple of days. And I ended up getting all the, the 50s UFO data. There's just so much and so many um, sightings. So I, I don't know. I, I abandoned that, but I do think it's definitely linked. Here we go. Here we go. On May 12th, 1954, four months after seeing War of the Worlds, he made his first contact with what he called space problems by aiming his cloud buster on luminous objects in the sky from his laboratory near Wrangley, Maine, called organon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they have the the <laughs> coordinates and the tracking he tracked these anomalies in the sky that were a different color and over the projection of the stars rotating whatever he uh noticed that those like things in the sky were different and they didn't shift in the same way as the stars and so he thought all right it's kind of it leads up to it and it's just like at, after this point, I knew there'd be no turning back to anything that we knew before, because then the light just disappears, and like, I don't know what happens. Probably falls this out of is the sky. Crazy. And... His team had directed draw pipes connected with the deep well. Hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So your cloud buster, just like the length of any. Think of. Um, when you blow into a beer bottle half full, it makes a certain noise. Drink it more and the noise is deeper. Just mm -hmm. like tuning rocks, tuning devices, tuning anything. We're making standard orgone on a standard frequency. These cloud busters um, have pipes buried to different levels. So if you had movable pipes, tunable pipes, mm -hmm. you could tune anything to a resonant frequency. Oh, yeah. And... <laughs> the dangerous bit about orgone. The dark orgone? If, you, if you're... All you have to do is place your orgone in the ground and then pool some water on top of it, making an orgone water feature. And then 
you connect your house's electricity to it. That's it. Wow. Just can wow. boost your uh, work on well, That's so simple. Uh, it is. They're doing it, but they're, they, <laughs> you can do a lot of damage with a thing like that. Well, and you can do a lot of good because he was, I think he's credited for causing grass to grow in um, desert areas by drying rain and busting clouds. Uh, let's see, Sierra Nevada, East of San Diego, the full breakthrough of the Oregon uh, energy flow, wet, uh, west and southeast into the desert basin. During 1955, the self-regulatory metabolic cycle process of the OR to DR, DOR, the dark or organ energy, to rain, um, OR energy had taken hold of the desert. So he was messing with the climate a lot and um, cosmic self-regulation or energy metabolism or in, in Oregon, oh. energy metabolism is what that chapter is called, but it's- Holy moly, look at this. This is his yeah, draw that's, ball. Yeah, that's his, they came and took that. They, the, the FDA came and jacked his, of all course. his stuff and burned all his books and brought him to jail and killed him. So, or well, whatever, he died of a heart attack which I was talking about a little bit last night with the um, Gestalt psychologists that came over. What? All happened. Yeah, they all, all the really oh, no, good psychologists. Oh, sorry. Psychologist. Uh, Victor has to go soon, so he may want to present some more of his stuff. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank Victor. you, Mike. We can get back to this. Hey. Yeah, I hope so. I like when you, uh, you talk about this, uh, Brittany. <laughs> what just came through the mud flood group uh, was really weird i wanted to get your guys take on this one Ooh. what is this it looks like an a cutter a stone cutter of some Ooh. kind maybe that's how they took those oh uh do you, do you have this that's on cool. uh this is no on... no i just got this it's like uh, 20 minutes ago from joanna uh on the mud flood researcher group you know that's that's yeah. why I, I i like to stay on so facebook cool. sometimes yeah. gems come through so i i know what you mean there's a facebook group i saw the victor shower application group and i've been looking at um let me just if you, but, but but also guys um, seen this? this is the spire sorry of uh, notre dame and uh look what i caught it doing right Ooh. Fire. Again with the mercury ball, and uh, this seems to be what we discussed earlier, um, Lee, that uh, you have mercury ball capacitator collects electrons from the ionized, uh, ionized atmosphere, and uh, then you have a bill or a collection of bills, they ring, it causes uh, vibrations to go up into the ball, and uh, it has collected electrons, and when the sound hits, those electrons, it causes them to um, emit in all directions. And then you would have um, oh. uh, receivers on buildings collecting them. Um, so what you're talking about is acoustic kinetic excitation of electrical energy. That's, that's changing mediums. Thank you, Nathan, to yes. Electricity. Well, you'll notice that Notre Dame is right next to a river also and this is the thing about these pyramids and these paths like we're talking about the forest you know there's a forest there at one point and there's a river so one of these things i was looking at was the uh, victor schauberger stuff from some of these kids in russia and water in these spiraling pipes right so you're looking at that drill looking thing and they've been doing a lot of victor schauberger drills i was trying to find a great example for you um there was one i think near the top somewhere Oh, Sorry. I thought you saw it, this part right here. These are the things that reminded me of the thing on, on that picture. I just saw these earlier. This Chinese guy. Oh, Ooh, girl, Global Vision has videos on towers hundreds of feet high in this shape. And yeah, all the towers, and they all use the same vector cycle. But if you look at water patterns with these, when the water we're gonna we're from, gonna see something. Um, I'm gonna show you something that will get back to that in just a second. Actually, I think I've. Um, um talked about this with a few of you so that's a weird folder name <laughs> pederast Re art revisited so Whoa. we have been talking about giants for a long time so could pederastry art and now i only have two pictures because we all know this we all know we have all seen the depictions is very vulgar you know 
But could it be instead of uh, adult and child, what about adult giant and adult regular sized guy having a homosexual relationship or maybe just any kind of relationship? Yeah, they this. could just be bros, it's true. Yeah, it could just be bros. Um, oh, yeah. I just read an article um, <laughs> about the myth of the widespread homosexuality in Greece that some historians are refuting based on literature now, uh, the idea that uh, homosexuality and pederasty was widespread. And um, oh. yeah, um, I might link that article to Andrea so some of the viewers might read that if they are interested. <laughs> so, so, so I also just thought about some of the art you see like this is like a little woman holding hands with like this very tall dude so could this be like a, a giant and a regular sized woman having a relationship that's what white guys fear about black guys and white girls <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm you just, giant, you never go back. Is that? I'm just, I'm just putting that idea out there. Um, so yeah, just um, moving on. I it's think true. I'll start with. I heard. This. I heard there's something about that. Once they get with giant white girls, they don't. They don't go back. I was thinking the flip side. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I was bit pretty excited right. about this find because. Um, I think we all knew along, and there are some architecture books that would, will tell you this, but this style of indus industrial architecture that is red bricked, it lacks ornamentation. It has a few symbols, but it generally lacks ornamentation if you compare it with the Greco Roman style. And it has this, um, you know, Asiatic Nor Norwegian uh, wood style around it as well. but. Generally, I'm very interested in the red brick um, architecture because I've seen a very interesting place in Denmark where we have this. It's called the Carlsberg um, factory uh, in Valby, uh, outside Copenhagen. And it has this very old tower. It's basically the same style. And it has griffins mounted on the, on the side of it. And it's very old and it's Russian by the looks of it, because it's the same style, has that torsion. I saw something just like this in Spain yesterday. I mean, similarly, yeah. stuff built right next to it. Like, they didn't know how, what to do. They didn't want to tear it down, but they needed that space or something. So this is distinctly Russian, according to an 1800s um, exposition catalog. And I found that to be a good good evidence for this architecture, this industrial red brick architecture, to be Tartarian, of course, besides the Griffin. But interesting yeah. that right next to it's a factory like tower. Like there's an another tower right next to it, like for some modern purpose. This wow. is Puny Louis Denmark, yeah. and and you have this. This is so you see the torsion again. This is Russian architecture, and you have the red brick, and you have the industry around it, and you have even elephants down here wow. and on one of the elephant side there is a swastika hmm. it's just there in plain sight a giant swastika for all the uh, danish people to see right next to carlsberg oh, yeah a it, it, you, you would uh, if, if i had a better picture I, I, it's very easy to find on google but there's a swastika here or, well, or here you. don't worry i trust you but yeah, you can see it's a very interesting <laughs> yeah. place. It's full of Greek mythology. Uh, and I know... love the Carlsberg factory. It's basically Willy Wonka's factory. I mean, it's yeah. beautiful. Uh, it has Greek mythology all over it, and it has this red brick. Oh, uh, look Russian... at the basements. I never thought about that. Oh, yeah. Mud I didn't have the Tartarian upgrade, but look at the basements. They're insane. Totally mud flutter here. And yeah, what the also... heck? There's not even a front door, you know? It's yeah. just straight up. And you can see you can see here this art is very very low it 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 messes with your you know perspective i guess you mm -hmm. you, you could imagine this to be very much you know on this art is like cut off in half right in height i guess but yeah we here it is again without the elephant oh yeah this is from the other side sorry so you get it here from oh it's the same side um and here outside again um, so yeah, what, what I'm just flabbergasted by is that you have this Russian architecture, now we know this, in the middle of Copenhagen. Mm. And it's like, it's unexplained for the most part. 
Wow, also, the, this, this is the, the yellow brick that is also surrounding this style. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it in many of the fac old factories in Denmark. It has the style of architecture. Yeah, the, the all of this area in Valencia right here is very yellow brick, too. And that's... Mm -hmm. This is Aarhus. It just stands in middle of industry, modern industry. But it's basically the same style. And here in Holland, I think, and here in Valby, again in Denmark, this is just an old. That is uh, my favorite that you've shown all day. Oh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. And that it's a much cool. flutter. Wish we lived there. <laughs> that so, could yeah, be this, this concludes the <laughs> Russian architecture of industry. <laughs> and it has that, uh, as I we talked about before, with the torsion. Look at that, how you build that torsion into it. Yeah. It's just, yeah, crazy. Okay, so Russian architecture, sorry to be a rush. Um, well, this is man, like the main those topic. Look Arabic to me. Well, that's the other thing. There's something connected with this idea of Moorish and Arabic, you know? So the, the Muslims in Russia, you know, it was connection with, with the, Russia's very big, and they brought a lot of people to Moscow, and Moscow got its culture differently than St. Petersburg did. So I wonder a lot about what we just decide to call Russian and what we decide to call Roman, because we, we've been saying the rowing Russo uh, people, the red, the redmans, you know, the redland people in Sweden that were, you know, connected to former Russia. And what is Estonia and what is Finland anymore? You know, according to uh, Ant Anatoly Fomenko, he suggests that um, that Moscow is actually Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. right. Muslim, and I've got to read his stuff. Yeah, it's a pretty it's weird. It's a pretty weird theory, but actually, it's getting to be less and less crazy sounding. I used to just think what you know, maybe he was just kind of autistic. Right? Right. So it might be that it was another thing very similar to Jerusalem. And the, 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 the dimensions for that, uh, yeah, for the city just miraculously pretty, pretty, fits. pretty perfect you know yeah. it's the right size i mean there's a lot of aspects but that though, could be Starport. another reason for as to why yeah that, that city might may fit um, that narrative like that, that could be a few other explanations as to why but i think you could probably find a number of cities that could is the only reason i have it like jumped you know full uh, gun in but that would be interesting to see if you could line it up with any other city um mm. that also would have existed at that point but but yeah, um, what I wanted to, to talk about is star forts and towers, uh, water towers and lighthouses as the main backbone of the old Ethernet grid or telegraphic grid. And this is, we're talking 1650s to 1750s, I guess. Um, and I found a lot of depictions where star forts are called signal forts and signal towers. And that's just a dead giveaway for me. And you have the symbol of a crossed flag coming outside of it. And I think this denotes either tele telegraphy or some other um, uh, wireless like, transmission. Yeah, just like uh, traffic controllers use the, the dual flags. So you can see down here. Yeah. Um, another tower signal and you have the tower of yeah. Portuang, uh here and, like and it's the tesla drawn... coil that's what that might be the fox the, the the flags maybe they're like electrical tesla you know how like energy rides up them oh yeah and we we, we had the flag on the lands as well uh, in the yeah. last uh, post so we, we, we're still hunting down what those flags are but we're thinking they are part of the device um and here's that tower as you can see over here that's that tower here and it has this huge mercury ball on top and it seems to be producing steam and it has those small dots that go along with all the art um the artificial fire um plants that we see in mercury balls and it's just a very interesting tower and it has all these lines coming from it as if it's like this huge router or um yeah Hub. Hub. Hub of connections to all these places. You exactly. See what they did to the tower now. 
it's, it's just the tower. Oh yeah, yeah, that's coming, Mike. We'll see how this tower looks like today. It's mm. definitely not the same tower anymore. Okay, I've I've got it. That's one of the few lighthouses I did mark down. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it it's just very it's completely different today. Um, but here you see again a star fort with a tower, and you have that we talked about the Lebris Lee. Um, that looks a bit that could be like a, the Libris shape um, from one angle, but it's it's also like the crescent you see on the Turks and um, right. uh, Sylvie uh, Sylvie Ivanova have shown schematics where atmospheric energy devices uses this exact shape. Right, it so, has to be significant if they've put it actually drawn it on a little. Uh, landmark on a map type thing. So, uh, what does it mean? Um, what do you mean? Uh, what does what what mean? <laughs> the Labrie. Oh, the Labrie. Uh, you can spell it L A B R Y S. Is that the Y head? Yeah, that would be that could be the Y head. Um, if you just give me one second, I think I. I have the Lepris in here somewhere. Um, no, I, I think not. Maybe uh, you'll have to Google that um, if you can. Um, so I, yeah, I'm gonna show you some more uh, star forts that are using clearly these signal antennas. There's a lot of them. Look at this. It just it, it just seems to be communication. Um, all of this. Look at how huge this one is. Look at just like the flag size. It would be like a sail on a boat, like a huge ship. And as that flag <laughs> flaps in the wind, it's going to collect how, how, friction. Also that, but how strong does this pole has to be, have to be? Like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, more of this. It looks like uh, the castle Saint Angelo in Rome, but it has that finial and the wires coming off of it as we see minarets do and and the is especially the byzantine finials they have that going on as well and here uh, an energy collector i think on top of a star fort so there's a lot of it this seems to be telegraphic telegraphy um i'm not sure and yeah, so the, the the old maps just have this all over, and I think the lighthouses and the water towers are playing in with this as well. Here again, and um, yeah, it's just I think it's uh, pretty solid. Gondolas? Is that like a gondola in that last one you had? This is also pretty cool. It looks like a pagoda, yeah. like a a pagoda inside a star fort. And then it's smashed. And yeah, and the minaret here. And it's basically this going on. And, and it, a lot of steam production also around the star forts. And this is a photograph from a, from the 1860s, I think. Wow. Giant Little fort. And it has just like these large antennas on it. Uh, a large lion as well in front of it. It's an interesting structure. But yeah, now we're getting into the towers and, and just how many um, instances of, of... And here you see more of this Russian architecture. And here, um, again, the lighthouse, and it has a mercury ball and... It would be multi-purpose in the sense that we have seen already these multi, uh, these mercury balls are able to produce light illumination. So it could be both a signal tower and a, a light tower. Mercury is coming up so often now. Sylvie was talking a bunch about mercury. In New yeah, World. yeah, mercury is yeah, it's a huge, huge key to understanding all of this. Oh, uh, wait, you see the price of mercury right now. <laughs> Really? Oh, look at this one. This one is so large. And it has two antennas on top. Like, is this a furnace or a signal tower? Hmm. 
and more Star Forge with antennas. It's just like a theme lighthouse here, huge hole, gaping hole, antenna, large flag, and, and now these towers. are still, these towers. are all multi purpose still. I mean, how many times do we see a telephone pole that has a power line on it? Or how many times do we see a satellite dish on the corner of somebody's mechanic shop? So these could also be attachments put on to existing functionality. I was interested when I saw those power lines earlier, I saw literally like cables that looked like a gondola system from one of the things. That's and yeah. Good. Also, are we, guys, are you seeing this? This is a Tartarian city. Yeah, and like Dutch. All the yeah. Tartarian city, 10 days travel at the side of the Great Wall, situated in the desert. Oh, interesting. What, did, what does it what? say down? Can you give me a, a picture? That could make That's a great so t-shirt. that you can read. I'm so glad you can read, too, Mike. I'm glad your mom made sure that you can read. I have That's a lot of, um, Mike could be very useful because we have so much material uh, in Dutch. I want this as a t-shirt. Well, I can send it to you. Let me translate the story. Lynn's back. Hey, Lynn. Hey, Lynn. Hi. Hi. Uh, look at this large tower here, finial. Um, yeah, so. Okay, there's something about these lines. You know, they're clearly saying that there's an energy or there's a, or there's a, there's a a proximity that's essential to something. Yeah, about lines. I mean, come on, look at this. Mm. This is geomancy, I would say. Um, and well, I have a whole, I have a whole folder just... on wow. geomancy. But look at just like the insane proportions of this tower, and how it's mounted in the middle. And you even have these small cottages, you know, built into the design. <laughs> It's just insanely. Oh, oh, way. Just or, think about. Way. Just think about the engineers of this age. It's just like wow. wow. And and yeah, this is one Martin shows a lot. The Century yeah. Tower. Don't know if this ever were built, but the plans for it exist, and it seems like to be this. It, it seems to be leaning as well, and we've been discussing how whether the leaning towers. There's an a method to the madness, so to speak, and there might be. I think oh, there is. Oh yeah, like aiming at a certain point, you know, the way satellite dishes aim at certain angles and points. Mm. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. could be. I'm not going to to say no. <laughs> oh, look at this one. Wow, it's the, the same sundown. thing again. Wow, just lone freestanding tower and large finial. Good. And just geomancy deluxe. <laughs> God. Just, yeah, I love that image. I want to live there. Yeah. Wow, those gardens are beautiful. They're beautiful. It's so ornate. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, you just wanna just wanna oh, curl yourself up and roll your oh, like it's... a blanket with this on. <laughs> Well, it's also interesting that at the center of the tower, I mean, around the tower are all these individual towers, kind of like uh, the Epcot Center. Like, it's like a, a neighborhood, but everyone's equal, proportionally distant from the center, so they're all connected to each other. It seems, like, weirdly equal. <laughs> yeah, like the Venus Project, kind of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. That Chinese hat. I thought that was a weird finial, or a weird um, finial, yeah. On this temple, never seen anything like it. Hmm. And also, these are these like stone. <laughs> Some of those designs remind me of a uh, Brighton Pavilion, which is a very old, most likely Tartarian architecture. It's got minarets and everything. Oh, it's can you go back to that. Were, were they holding something? Were those containers stone? Those, I mean, could something be in there? No, or is it just a solid mass? Oh, oh, and could look like those uh, small bags that uh, the old guys are wearing in the pictures, you know, um, that bag that uh, mm -hmm. all the ancient gods seems to be carrying. On cool. The old, yeah, could be the, it's the same thing here. I don't know, but it, it could just, also I'm just be like a small bag. I'm talking about the actual giant structure there. Like, is there something inside of that if that's like 
What are those? <laughs> it's just, you know, in, in, in modern archaeology or in archaeology, everything is a temple or a tomb. Yeah. So you only have those <laughs> options. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Uh, so Make yeah, I, I wouldn't go with their um, narrative if I were you, but <laughs> This this tower I just think is so cool. I think wow. this is in um, Cairo or Constantinople, and it's a signal tower. I think it's not a lighthouse. It doesn't seem to be like a light. It's a signal tower, and one more here. Martin showed this. Uh, I sent it to him to be fair, but still, Martin showed <laughs> it before me. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. I just this is just a crazy tower. Wow. Supposed to be in France somewhere in the 1800s, and this is all. These are all during times when the bulk of mankind is supposed to be so embroiled in war. How the how the fuck did we have time for this? Mm, yeah, it looks like a bored man's project. <laughs> yeah, we we had too much time uh, at one point. It would seem. Uh, also, this very industrial, modern, and this is like very old, uh, a metallic lighthouse, completely metallic. That's gorgeous. That's cool. And and this one in, I think this is in. Oh yeah, the the Cronel, the column, the Cronel column. Oh, it's just wonderful technology. Look at this. And it, it has a coil in here. That is and so yeah. funny. You can walk to the top through the spiral stairs. Yeah. And and, and old... imagine how you would be energized by all of this water around you. In the old books that that I've got up on the foundry, they show all of this. And in the wheelhouses, they would use towers like this. And in the center wouldn't be a staircase. It would be an Archimedes screw. The river would turn it itself. This and seems to be the same. Up. This seems to be like the same type of tower, just w without. Yeah, the... it's all the same shapes, and the purpose may be changed. The shapes may be. Uh, and it's completely metallic. This one. That's cool. That's all Is that a stairway? Oh my gosh! Looks like a water slide. Yeah. Uh, and here you see like this telegraphic lighthouse. So here we at least see that multi-purpose yeah, in plain yes. sight. So you have telegraph mm. and lighthouse. In I one saw of the that. Same. That was awesome. Yeah, well, you know, so here you have it uh, from the the horse's mouth, and and you have that flag either way, whether it's mm. a telegraph or a lighthouse, you have that flag. You guys, uh, you know about the. Tr yes, I love this picture. Oh yeah, this is from the um, the Paris Exposition, and it's a front of the obelisk. And these seems to be though these were before, um, and they they are they are gone now, of course, but they just look like atmospheric. Technology. Yeah, they're doing. They look, that's like the organator or the space gun pipes, like <laughs> just going across. Oh, 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 Andreas, do you see like how this looks like the middle of the? Yeah. Ink? Exactly, it was what I was thinking. It's yeah. just in completely, and also what's weird to me is now that you say that, look right above it, and do you see how the black shadowed point? Oh, almost... would be that be the end edge of the staff? Yeah, wow. I mean, it looks like it. Also, what's trippy to me is that obelisk right next to it's covered <laughs> yeah. in all of the hieroglyphs. But you never, yes, you never need to worry could, about. Could that. this be like a, an a hint? <laughs> that, I mean, <laughs> it's it's like overkill. It's like overkill. They're like, you yeah, know, uh, this uh, they just want to make yeah. sure they all work, right? They brought so, it in from somewhere. Oh, yeah, oh they, that's that's a they, fact, by the way, that they brought them and, in from and, Africa. And, Do you know that and, they had to bring these oh, back to Ethiopia? This wait. is probably the one that they brought back to Ethiopia because they had to tear oh. it down, and it lost about a foot in height, and they never actually assembled it properly again. Yeah, you know this what? this plinth that it sits on when they were putting them up from France to to Italy and everywhere else, they put them on those 40-foot plinths. Well, the and other so, thing is they broke them up to do it. So I mean, yeah, imagine... They couldn't yeah. figure out how to lift them. I mean, geez, like, you smash up a phallus. I mean, and it, 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 that's when they finally returned the one to Ethiopia that I was referring to in 1980 or whatever, um, 
they never quite got it reassembled right so it, it just looks all messed up and also you know, angled. guys i'm just thinking about this think about the logic think about this logically the companions of the obelisk so um does yeah. this look um does this look like something that would you know accompany this thing mm -hmm. yeah. in any way yeah it doesn't on face value look like it i think this looked like to be like something modern and well, then i think they believed that the egyptians were quite modern in the 18th and 19th century i think it's pretty common to believe that the egyptians were advanced more advanced yeah. than they were at that moment i think people knew at mm. that moment that they were at less advanced than their but, society had been but could it also be that you know Companion. So this is like a main. This is like a device, and these are like you know, um, yeah, com mm -hmm. accompanying this in whatever it does. Yes, Mike. Yes, the the obelisk. The, the ether. Your pillars. Doesn't that yeah. their ether runs east to west or whatever? This is a, a gigantic telegraph tower that Martin has shown a lot of times. But oh it's my the gosh. same idea. Yeah, it's insane. It's a really good postcard. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and yeah, uh, and, and this one is um, one uh, is in France, but here you see the as you see on the the, the castle Saint Angelo in Rome, those wires going up to the mercury ball, the finial. Yeah, there's some complicated telegraph tech. Oh, this is <sighs> how the Tower of Courtouin looks today. Right. That, crazy steampunk tower we saw earlier this is what it what's left of it. Uh, it i think this may be part of some of the original construction but this painted over this though, thing, and plastered over yeah maybe painted and plastered over. this this part and up is completely uh, new mm -hmm. and, but this foundation however seems to be part of the old structure completely so this may be very old and it may stretch further down I would believe well, so. But. It's possible that that center part could have been part of the original, and the outside was there. Might have been two walls, and the outer wall is gone. You know, and the inner part might have been a core. That could also be. I have a question, and, and, real quick, for you too. Um, with the telegraph, the one these things that you're showing, how then could we have images of like telegraph tech before it was invented or before it was patented, I guess. Oh yeah, I, sorry, Edison. my bad that I haven't uh, even mentioned that. Of course, yeah, these, it's kind of a big deal. These telegraphic uh, things are way before. For instance, let me just uh, show you That's some like of the first one. These are for like on Edison, big time. If he's using the name, these you think these is like seventeen hundreds, like seventeen oh one. Busted. Edison was was like a hundred and. 80 years late he's just the reason it's famous yeah we were talking about that last night but how like how does he gets to patent that so that when someone at the time be like no we already have this you have to do they change the well, name the, enough to make it his you know there wasn't a patent office before yeah. oh Benjamin i suppose franklin. that's right that's right so, yeah Benjamin but, franklin but also, actually did the lightning rod, you know and then i've been that, talking that's... about the the star forts being signal for it somehow and i've already shown this autographic view where it says gallery the communication so i yeah. think that yay yeah i think totally those took two it. things fits oh just getting gosh. crazy this crazy. is so cool i was looking at the new patents these are like the old this telegraph is, patents this is, what is this, <laughs> which star fort is this this is bastion oh my God. This is Bastion <gasps> Fossey, not to be confused with Bob Fossey. Uh, I, it's, it's so one... funny. When he presented this, my first thought were that these depressions were heat sinks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks very chip-like, very computer yeah. chip-like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and, and before the heat sink stuff. And I think that that um, heat HVAC uh, or central heating system is that a crane? The idea is, has a lot of merit as well. Do you oh, see this a, is a crane attached to that? What's going on with that? This is a huge pyramid, as the Gothic people would make it. And but this what's, top area. Little, what's the line sticking off of it? It looks like a crane. Flag. Uh, oh, that's yeah, a flag. Might a flag. Okay. Might yeah. be. Oh, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, so this is Babar architecture. This is Tripoli. Tripoli in Algeria, I think. Yeah, Tripoli in Algeria. And it used to have this large pyramid, as the Goths would build it. And this mm. is naval. 
and it has this huge star. look at look at how big Ooh. the star oh for it is. Gosh, I love it. Love Just it. look, this is a huge structure, right? This is what like is a gigantic happening? structure, and this like a star for it. Those look like pipes coming out of the bottom. Go yeah. all the way down. Those look like nope. Uh, in the bottom walls, yeah, those look like waste pipes. Oh, but <laughs> to me, they look like arches, like very large, high arches. Oh, I could see that too, waste but pipe. oh, yeah, oh, they're could also on the be west pipes, side. could also be pipes like a large fence, huh? Depends well, how you look at it, right? If that's a manufactory, then but I, I just, I just, you know, marvel at the size of this stuff board. It's just so tall and yeah, because we live in shitty smooth. apartments. Yeah, but yeah, it's just <laughs> and look at this uh, weird structure in front of it, like this heart section, like Pac-Man shape, and then all these buttresses coming from it. Like, what's going on with this? I've never seen such a building before. But yeah, this is the top of Naples, like the 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 hill looking over the city. Um, yeah, and another fort it might be hard to see the finial. Could it be a potential siege tower? I mean, it look, some of those bits look like wooden slats to try and hold something up, or maybe some kind of, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird shape, isn't it? Yeah, it, it has this very pointy star shape. Uh, I think it's six sided one, two, three. I think I need yeah. to. I'm, I'm. My jet lag is getting to me, so I'm probably gonna have to take off. Is it possible I could show about four pictures of the bricks I got today in retrospect, really quickly? Yeah, I'm just. Uh, I'll be finished with uh, this uh, picture session. Um, let's just see if there's anything really. Oh yeah. I don't want to. And I don't want to end what you're doing. It's not what I want either. And we've seen this before, but yeah. Also, possibly a signal for it with the altitude. Yeah, up on um, and also here, Parma has this inner tower. And these are the waterborne forts I've sent to Martin before. But yeah, these, these could are. be like uh, marine routers, you know, to reach other continents. You might have to mount some out in the ocean. Um, yeah, wow. but they are awesome. That's like a yeah, it's amazing that they could do that. Like, oh, how, it's gonna yeah. ship this because how's it gonna tower. how's it gonna dry? You know, and like the you know, there's mortar to keep the bricks together and everything. Oh, have to there's, do. there's a specific type of mortar mm -hmm. that they were using from the 15th century on that would uh, set underneath water. Wow, yeah. this is all water-based um, crypts. But yeah, uh, th this was the end, and just. Uh, one thing I wanted uh, to show before Andreas takes takes it away is um, I've made a history bust of, I think, huge proportions. There's this uh, book called Civitas Viri. I can uh, show you uh, here. This is the book. And um, what it shows is it is a 1514 book. And um, this will be the last thing I show, but I, it's it's just mind blowing when you when you see what it is. Uh, so here you see that image I just showed you. This is like a huge uh, round fort, and this is steam. And also the first and centerfold. There's in a lot of people. Yeah, you would have to look up. It's not the actually Good the point. important part. This is it this is, is not at all the exciting part about what is in this book. So, um, you would have to take a guess. And say, who is that guy? Just take a guess. Hermes. I think it's a little small. Oh, is it, is it close enough? Okay, so no good guesses. Not Hermes. That was my no, first. No, it's thought. not Hermes. This is the 1600s, and this is Aristotle. Oh. 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 Hanging out in the 1600s with uh, wow. Queen of France, with That's the Queen a, of France. Wow! Oh my gosh! I didn't Margarita. see that before. That's amazing. I mean, that really, uh, that really adds some clout Hold to that the picture. Still, real quick, theories, doesn't it? Wow! Wow! And there's uh, oh. a, a few more pictures uh, of very 
huge interest in this book. So. Fomenko is like, that's what I was trying to say. What was, that, <laughs> what was that calligraphy also? That page had a language that looks... Um, Who is that writing. one again? Did you see the... But now the we're going into the labyrinth. Uh, yeah, there's a few of those coming up today. Uh, Sacramentum of Minerva, the two trees. Uh, they're talking about a specific event. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that could very much be that they're um, that he's you showing this uh, Queen of France. Back. Oh, you, you will you will get the chance to, but also look at this. This is a reptile going into the ground, or an animal, an mm -hmm. underground animal, and and these are giants uh, uh, compared with the little people going around in this circle somehow. That look like a and this is a building, and this is a. This is Fleur de Lis. She's wearing Fleur de Lis next to Aristotle. And I also want to point out that Aristotle, I have never seen him being depicted with a hat on before. That's just yeah. unheard of. Yeah. Like this hat. But Hermes and, often is. Yeah, it's right? the 1600s. So it makes me yeah. wonder why they're making him look so hermetic. What is it, what is it about Aristotle then? That he's a some sort of a resurrection like um, time traveler or immortal, or because you know he gets killed as the little ending story, right? Definitely linked this book to me. Look how yeah. tiny those people were around them. Also, That's kind of yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, what she's called Regina Margarita. Um, and she's called Regis Gallie, so the regent of uh, Gallie, um, that would be France, or yeah, very close to France. Um, so that's just fucked up. And that's also why she's uh, wearing fleur de lis, I would guess, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the symbol of France. Uh, but also um, the symbol and of the, the Aristotle the is uh, showing her something. Um, like a dragon, seemed... the talent. It's like a talons, like a dragon thing. Will you go to uh, the or description version. of P? Yeah. The description of P. Avaritia uh, ipsa specie monstrosa. So it is a monstrous animal. Avaritia, uh, uh, that would mean something with a bird. Um, ave, ava, that, that's a bird. Something Avaritia. with a bird. Uh, yeah. That would be something Wait, with flight or bird. birch. That's, that's mm -hmm. avarice. Hmm. I thought I was going in the ground. Is this a different one? Well, he's showing her the. You can the see bird that bird that's bird. a bird. bird, bird oh, feet. yeah, it is. Bird oh, my feet. gosh. These are scales. Mm -hmm. And that's a lion's that's a scale. Bird. Yeah, like a griffin. Oh, my gosh. But it looks like he's wearing armor, isn't it? Like, couldn't this looks like an armor? Like, what yeah, else could just be scales? See. The line right there. But I first thought was a manticore, but it's not a uh, serpent's tail. Well, very griffin-like, but I don't see any wings right off yeah. the top. But the uh, yeah, or li the, the griffin's tail is a lion's tail. Um, perhaps the wings were held down by the but armor. Yeah, this is just leave. a massively interesting oh. book, and it, it has it has has more where antiquitech oh devices. Um, Which one is this fuck? What is this? Margin has shown this before. Why can't I? Civita spend even more room. Yeah. Civ. Yeah, it's, it's called true. I think it means true city. Civitas yeah, very. That one. Uh, oh yeah, but why can I fucking open? Oh sorry, I I'm gonna I'm get a duck. <laughs> another duck. Another duck at Civis. There's, a duck at this there's two. What I don't know why I cannot get into the thing right now. Well, hold on, because I'm. There's no way I, I could like. I can't keep. I'm gonna pass out. So I kind of wanted to show four pictures. Oh yeah. Really quickly. Can we just? Really, I want you to keep doing Definitely. this though. Just cut my for a man. second, and then I'm gonna go back. Don't stop though. Just keep that. I wanted to show you guys really quickly. I got first. There's this pyramid rock. Uh, it's been all torn out, and all of these places where they bricked up the doors that are completely bricked. And you can see the old style versus the new style. The new style uh, were done in the 50s and 60s and then the 80s with some calamari. And there's buildings here that they've completely torn up. You can see the old building plus the new building, which were all done for like the social architecture. Look at all of these like street buildings that are all like two stories tall. 
once you get to this area where all the electricity comes out from this corner, there's uh, water right by the beach and then all these old buildings that you know are this yellow brick style. And the yellow brick is just everywhere. Um, but you'll find crazy art style everywhere. And they're building the new, you know, buildings also or that are coming. I want to see if I can find um, the church that I went to. Look, had this Moorish style, right? So right over here is this like elevated building, like a pagoda, if you notice on the right, and it's on top of these, you know, pillars. But you get to the church, it's got this old Moorish dome, and then you got the the top with the bell and these bells are ringing all the time inside you've got immaculate amounts of gold and a pipe organ that is still in use and it makes me wonder like what are they you know using the organ for back at this point um but also these ornate structures when you get close to them you see where they've been filled in with brick and so you see that they they patch a lot of them so you can start like right now is a perfect time because you go through there and you find that they're carrying them apart you see the old brick the new brick and then the stonework and the stonework is you know very different um cut to further yeah so right here this is the one that really got me right over this you know cool. area go back this, to that tower that yeah. looks exactly like those towers I was talking right. about along the Russian architecture. So, so let me give you like a little a little walk to this point. So you go to the beach, and right by the beach, there's like a this building right here, and this building is all lifted, and then underneath it, you know, it's, it's hard to cut, but right here you can see that there's a basement where the floor is. So you have to step up because there's another floor below it, kind of similar to the one that you were pointing out at mm. the, the Carlsberg Brewery. Anyway, these two mall-like structures, look how they're elevated on either side of it, and then they, they rope around, like they're parking structures, right? Oh, yeah, right. That, that, that's part of the new modern uh, way of thinking. I think it was a French architect in the modernization of Paris mm -hmm. had an idea about building structures on pillars for, um, you know, social architecture projects. And then right behind it is another is this building. So this building is like it's hard. I need to get a better photo of it because it's like it was hard to get to because of this other structure. But this building behind it is made of the same yellow bricks and it's from the same period and it extends right beyond it. But this hmm. this building right here goes right up to the wall and then there's a tunnel right here. So right on the other oh. side of it, you know, right behind it, you can get people were walking down into the underground there to get to the building that oh, was like a yeah, yeah, yeah. For them. and that, that's that's definitely indicative of a mud flood if yeah. anything huh everywhere around here you've got these old lamps and you got all these yellow brick buildings and there's a lot of very new things admittedly but like there's a lot of tunnels everywhere which i thought was very interesting and you know they're they're kind of they're all like ones that they've hidden they've like made you think that they're like oh yeah it's supposed to be here but is it really i don't know because hmm. they're, they're yeah they're old they're not like new tunnels built for the transit system and they're not tunnels you're supposed to go into they're just part of these old buildings um but yeah that was basically all i wanted to show before i pass out it's Oh yeah, and I I also have to um, to go now, guys. So so Nathan, please pull up uh, yeah that book so you can talk further on it. Um, look look in look at the other pictures in it. There's a lot of antiquity devices in it. So Actually, yeah, guys. Mike, yeah, oh, Mike, Mike, and Victor. I think we're gonna at some point because we're on your and maybe even Lee because we're on this European time thing. We could do something on a like a Euro wave uh, as well. <laughs> Are we remaining or are we going? We got to talk about a volcano. You want to keep on talking about volcanoes, Bridget? Hells yes. What's the deal with the volcano stuff? Well, that's something I'm not so familiar with. Well, what's the uh, angle of that? Volcanism may have been harnessed in the past. Oh, and. Um, Brittany. Um, Brittany was looking into uh, subsurface volcanoes in the oceans. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian.
you're interested in trying out the foundry, just visit tartarinova.com 